Welcome to Bloodborne Pathogen Standard, Influenza, and Infection Control. This is UBHC's annual training. I'm Shafali Kumar, supervising APN for Clinical Laboratory Services and Infection Control. If at any time during this session you may have questions that need immediate attention, please call Shafali Kumar, supervising APN for Laboratory Services and Infection Control at 732 235-4739 or 732-221-1607, weekdays between the hours of 8 and 4.30. After hours, you can page the Acute Level of Care Assistant Nurse Manager at 732-789-4629. Or you can even page or call the VP of Acute and Nursing Services at the number listed below. Why Bloodborne Pathogen Training? OSHA's Bloodborne Pathogen Standards is the law in New Jersey. It is a federal regulation that is designed to help protect the health and well being of healthcare workers and requires that all UBHC employees follow certain precautions to protect themselves from exposure to blood and other potential infectious materials. Learning Objectives Module 1 We will cover the employer's requirements of OSHA's Bloodborne Pathogen Standards and how standard precautions protect against bloodborne pathogens. We will also describe chain of infection as it applies to bloodborne pathogen disease. We will discuss work practices, including personal protective equipment, hand hygiene, engineering controls that reduce risk of exposure to bloodborne pathogen, and vaccinations. Lastly, we will summarize employers and employees' responsibility in case of an occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogen and specific exposure control plan. Module 2 will cover influenza and infection control. Module 1, bloodborne pathogens and standard precautions. The major provisions of bloodborne pathogen standards include definition of bloodborne pathogens, Exposure Control Plan at UBHC that is updated annually. We will clearly define our methods of compliance with the Bloodborne Pathogen Standards. That we provide vaccinations against Hepatitis B. And specific exposure follow-up. We will also provide you, our employees, with hazard communication and training that we have specific record keeping related to any bloodborne pathogen exposure. Bloodborne pathogens. First of all, we'll just state the definition. Bloodborne pathogens are any microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, parasites that are found in blood and other potentially infectious materials or bodily fluids. Bloodborne pathogens can cause diseases in humans. These diseases include, but not limited to, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, malaria, syphilis, etc. Now we will talk about our standards of compliance and our methods of compliance. We will talk about standard precautions engineering and workplace controls, personal protective equipment, some of our housekeeping regulations, how we dispose of our biohazard waste, and some laundry handling. Standard precautions is what we practice every day at UBHC. We treat all blood and bodily fluids, secretions and excretions as if they were infectious. We use personal protective equipment when we anticipate any bodily fluids exposure. 
non-intact skin must be covered, which means if you have any type of cut, a burn, or open wound on your skin, please cover it, as this will act as a route of entry or portal for bloodborne pathogen. Please avoid touching your nose, mouth, and eyes at any time, as mucous membranes allow the entry of infectious organisms into the body. We advise you to perform hand hygiene often and correctly. These basics are the foundation of standard precautions. We also provide for engineering control. Engineering controls means we have equipment and devices that reduce exposure to occupational hazard through the use of engineered equipment, such as puncture resistant sharps containers, needleless systems, protective needles with sheeting, personal protective equipment, chemotherapy, gloves, etc. These particular items isolated or remove bloodborne pathogen hazard from the workplace. They minimize the risk of exposure. The employer must evaluate all available engineering controls. Train employees on how to use and dispose the devices and also implement appropriate engineering controls. Syringes with self-sheathing feature is the standard feature here at UBHC. Add-on safety features are used for our blood drawing equipment. In the area of sharps management, please remember to place all sharps in sharp disposal containers and replace sharp containers once it is three-fourths full. These containers should be readily available in patient care area, clearly marked with biohazard symbol, puncture-resistant and leak-proof, closable, and maintained in an upright position. Never reach into the trash container to pull anything out. It is important to remember to never to recap, break, bend any device with a needle. As part of the exposure control plan, we must also keep a sharps injury log. All incidents must be reported promptly and incident report must be completed with the following information type and brand of the device involved, area or department where the incident took place, and what happened, description of how the incident occurred. Now let's move on to personal protective equipment. PPE is used whenever potentially infected materials could contact your skin or mucous membranes which includes gloves, masks, eye and face protectors, gowns, and footwear. Types of PPE used at UBHC. Gloves to protect hands, gowns to protect skin or clothing, goggles to protect eyes, masks to protect nose and mouth, shoe covering to protect tracking of blood, or other potential infectious material. In certain clinical areas, we use face shields to protect the entire face and forehead. In order to safely use PPE, there are a few rules you need to follow. Keep gloved hands away from your face to prevent contamination. Avoid touching or adjusting other PPE. Remove your gloves if they become torn. Perform hand hygiene before and after removing gloves. Always use a new pair of gloves for each patient and change them if damaged. 
if you work in housekeeping area, and if you're going to handle contaminated sharps, use puncture resistant gloves. How to remove gloves. Here is the exact procedure. You may pause the video, read the directions, and then proceed to the next slide. Under what circumstances would you wear personal protective equipment safely? When transporting a patient in a wheelchair, would you wear anything? No, you don't require to wear gloves. However, if the patient is on isolation precaution or has some infectious process going, then you would wear gloves, gowns, depending on uh, whatever is going on. Drawing blood, you definitely need to wear gloves. Responding to an emergency when blood is spurting or there is broken glass. You would wear gloves, gown, mask, eye protection, shoe covering. You'll have to wear everything, all the personal protective equipment that's available. How about when examining a patient with undiagnosed rash? You definitely wear gloves. Lastly, cleaning and incontinent patient with diarrhea. You would definitely need to wear gloves and if you know that the patient might have norovirus, you would also have to wear gloves, down, sorry. Hand washing and hand sanitizing is the most effective way to prevent the spread of infections. Why is hand hygiene so important? Because many infections that are acquired in healthcare settings are spread through our hands. Spread of other resistant microbials such as MRSA, VRE, is through contaminated hands. It is the primary route of transmission and is a major public health problem today. Here at UBHC, we follow Center of Disease Control hand hygiene guidelines. We use these guidelines to improve hand hygiene and to reduce health acquired infections. How do we perform hand hygiene? We wash our hands with soap and water when our hands are dirty or contaminated, and we use alcohol-based products routinely and when soap and water is not readily available. How do we perform hand hygiene? Our recommendations for hand hygiene technique is when using alcohol-based hand rubs, we typically take about dime size alcohol-based product onto our palms, and then we rub our hands together, covering all the surfaces until dry. When washing our hands with soap and water, we wet our hands with warm water, apply soap, rub hands together, and cover all surfaces for 20 seconds. And the guidelines have changed. It's not 15 to 20 seconds, it's 20 seconds. Rinse and dry with paper towel. Then turn off faucet using paper towel. Now let's talk about change of now let's talk about chain of infection. How does infection occur? First thing you need is a pathogenic organism. You need a suitable source that allows microorganisms to survive and multiply. Then you need a mode of escape from the source. You need a mechanism of transmission, a portal of entry and a susceptible host. In mental health settings, this can occur via direct contact of body fluids, indirect contact, contaminated objects, such as doorknob, pens, phone, stethoscopes, desk, blood pressure cuffs, keyboards, contact with eyes, nose, and contact with oral mucosa, when someone coughs and sneezes, airborne 
microorganisms are suspended in the air. Again, all blood and bodily fluids can be infectious and thus we must sanitize our hands regularly. Cover our mouth when coughing, wearing a mask to limit contamination, getting vaccinated, use personal protective equipment and adhere to safe practices. And this is the only way we can reduce break the chain of infection. Now there are uh, high risk tasks and situations here at UBHC or at any acute care facility where we need to be carefully examining how we handle sharps and needles. Any situation when handling sharps and needles, encountering splatters, broken glass, large spills of blood, or other potentially infectious materials, in any situation, whether it's an accident or an injury has occurred, we need to follow certain guidelines. How do we control exposure at UBHC? First of all, we should always wear gloves. We should minimize contact. Don't touch broken glass with bare hands. Call EVS for large spills. Sanitize your hands. Make sure you're vaccinated with the hepatitis B vaccine series. Implement safe work practices by following policies and procedures. Use only approved cleaning products. I just made the slide so that everybody's aware of the products that we use here at UDHC. Oxivir wipes or sprays, Clorox germicidal wipes, hand sanitizers that contain at least 60% of alcohol, and when in doubt, ask your supervisor for the product approved for your area and make sure you do not clean any large spills. Call EOC or EVS. Small spills that are less than six inches in diameter or equal in six inches of diameter. Always wear personal protective equipment Control the spill by blocking traffic flow. Get the spill kit if housekeeping is not available. Read instructions and follow steps carefully. Cover the spill with absorbent material that's provided in the spill kit. And if it's a very small spill, absorb the material with paper towels. Disinfect it with one to 10 proportion of bleach and water and mop up the area. Lastly, decontaminate with the facility approved disinfectant. All towels and rags must be placed in a biohazard disposable bag or bin. If broken glass is a possibility, use the disposable scoop to collect glass fragments and place into a shop's container. For the large spills, Make sure you notify your supervisor, and your supervisor will notify RVS, and the phone number is listed here. Make sure you remain available to speak to the RE, RVS staff, and they will arrange for the spill uh, cleanup. Hepatitis B vaccination. So the hepatitis B vaccination is very effective. 95% of the population does develop immunity. It is a series of three dosages. It's safe, it's effective, and long-lasting. And um, the time of employment, when you go through employee health, they check for titers of the hepatitis B, among other titers. And if you're hepatitis B levels are low, or if you don't have adequate antibody response, they do revaccinate all the employees that work for UBHC to develop adequate antibody response. Now, what do you do 
despite of being careful and taking care of and uh, following the uh, policies and procedures and there is some sort of exposure. First of all, you need to flush the site with plain water for approximately five minutes. Clean the wound, if there's a wound, with soap and water for 20 seconds. And that applies uh, for the mucous membrane. So if you have a splash in your eyes or your nose or your mouth, rinse it well for at least four to five minutes. Immediately inform your supervisor. Incident report must be completed. You'll be advised to be evaluated by one of the facilities. If it's Monday through Friday between 8 and 4, you'll go to Iyoshi or occupational medicine, depending on where you work. And after hours, if you work in this area, it would be Robert Wood Johnson Hospital, ER. If you work in Newark, it's University Hospital. If you work elsewhere, it would be the nearest uh, Rutgers facility, ER. Module 2, Influenza and Infection Control. Influenza vaccine is offered to all employees free of charge annually. It is critical and crucial that all UBHC employees obtain immunization to prevent the spread of flu to our consumers and our peers. There is a myth that influenza vaccine causes the flu. It does not. Influenza does not cause the flu. It takes two weeks for the flu virus to activate and create antibodies. So if in the midst you have caught something, it's not the immunization that's causing the flu. Yes, flu vaccine does have some mild side effects. It could be soreness at the site. You might have slight fever or body aches. That just means that our immune system is responding to the vaccine and the antibodies are being created. Influenza vaccination is an important UBHC employee's responsibilities. All employees must get vaccinated or provide attestation. That means you have received vaccination elsewhere and not with our organization. And you would need to provide proper proof to receive a sticker. If you decide to de decline, you still need to fill out the form and you will have to wear the mask for the flu season. Employees' responsibilities. So in an event, if you have any of these symptoms, you must report to your supervisor and explain what symptoms you have. This way, we can keep track that there's no spread of infection or there are clusters or there's some sort of outbreak. So if you have a fever above 100.4, diarrhea, unknown rash, cough that has lasted three weeks or more, and vomiting. You must report to your supervisor with the specific symptoms. Another responsibility that all employees have is to receive annual PPD testing. And if you're a known positive for the PPD, make sure you fill out the questionnaire, which is available via EOSHI annually in lieu of testing. And you must report any clusters of three or more people, that includes consumers and staff members, becoming ill with same symptoms. And uh, the infection control supervisor must be reported at this listed phone number. Our annual flu vaccination goal is at least 90%. And so we should keep that number in mind. And we should try to get vaccinated every season. If we choose to not get vaccinated, or for some reason you cannot get vaccinated, you must wear a mask in all patient area. That includes the restrooms, the hallways, and the cafeteria during the flu season. No exceptions. Some important policies. Refrigerators that so store consumer food, medication, or lab specimens must be clearly marked and the temperatures logged daily. These items, food and medication and lab specimens, cannot be combined in the same refrigerator. 
Any out of range temperatures must be explained on the log and corrected. Consumers that are ill with either fever of 100.4 or above, or with an undiagnosed rash or are vomiting, diarrhea, night sweats with cough, must be immediately excluded until medically cleared. In acute care inpatient setting, if there's any suspicion of any communicable symptoms, immediately isolate the patient until diagnosis or treatment established. Any clusters of three or more people with similar symptoms within the time frame of 48 hours must be reported by the supervisor to the infection control preventionist and the phone number is listed here. Any toys in the offices or waiting rooms must be cleaned per UBHC policy. This must be documented on the toy washing log. Consumer education regarding respiratory hygiene, cough etiquette, and hand sanitizing should occur at every available opportunity. Food safety. Food must be stored, prepared, and served according to strict food safety guidelines available on the UBHC website. Food prepared at home cannot be brought in and shared with consumers. UBHC may only serve food prepared by licensed food establishment to ensure standard and safety. Unit party food and leftover food cannot be left out without refrigeration for more than two hours. Who is responsible for infection control at UBHC? We all are. Summary. Just to go over quick things that I just spoke about. Apply work practice controls to limit risk of accidents. Make sure you wear personal protective equipment as needed. Meticulous hand washing regularly and correctly. Use only approved cleaning products. Vaccination programs are the cornerstone of healthcare services, so please get vaccinated. Report reason of illness when calling in sick, specifically the five symptoms that I had listed previously. Do not forget bloodborne pathogen mandatory training, TB testing, and flu vaccination is done annually. Review infection control policies regularly. Thank you for listening. This is Shafali Kumar, and this is my contact information if you need to reach me for some reason. Thank you.